This FizzCast will analyse a motion problem using conservation of energy. Pause the video now to read through the question carefully. Now that you've read the question, first let's identify what's being asked. The last sentence here asks how fast the object is going at a particular location. The question also provides a lot of information about the problem. For example, it tells us the mass of the object in question. It tells us there's a spring with certain properties, such as its spring constant and its natural length. And it tells us some initial conditions, where the ball begins and how fast it's moving. In addition, it also tells us that the ball is thrown straight upwards. Let's begin by trying to interpret what's going on in this particular problem. Importantly, there are some forces acting on an object as the object is moving, so we might like to understand how we can analyse those forces. The forces that we have here are the gravitational force, and there's a spring attached, so there's going to be some kind of spring force as well. We could ignore any force from the hand, or whatever else is launching the ball, because we're being given information here about what happens after the launch. So these are the two forces that are involved. Our gravitational force here is constant, but our spring force here is not constant. This tells us that the acceleration in this problem will not be constant acceleration at all. And therefore we cannot approach this problem using our equations of motion. Remember, the equations of motion we have are only valid when the acceleration doesn't change. So that tells us we're most likely going to be using considerations of work and energy to look at this problem. Moving on to the development phase of our solution, it's useful to draw a diagram of the situation. So if this is the ground, we know we have a ball that's attached by a spring to the ground and it starts off in our problem one metre above the ground and the ball is moving upwards at 12 metres per second. That's our initial state. And we know that at some time later the ball has moved upwards, still attached by the spring, but the spring has stretched and we're now 2 metres above the ground and what we'd like to know is how fast is the ball moving at that point. Another important piece of information we have is that the spring itself has an unstretched length of only 0.55 metres. So we can see that at all cases here our spring is actually much longer than its unstretched length. So in this development stage we can see the kind of issues we have in the problem and if we're going to approach it using work and energy we can say that we might like to consider what's happening to our change in mechanical energy and in fact in this instance that will be zero because there are no non-conservative forces acting. The only forces we have are gravity and the spring force and they are both conservative forces so our mechanical energy will be conserved. That means that our initial kinetic plus our initial potential energy must equal our final kinetic plus our final potential energy. And what do we have here for potential energy? Importantly, our potential energy here will be a combination of gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy from the spring. And we can write those potential energies as mgh for our gravitational potential energy and a half kx squared for our elastic potential energy. Now we can move on to the evaluation step. We can write down some properties now of our initial conditions, our initial kinetic energy will be a half m v initial squared and I actually know all of those values from the question, I know the mass, I know the initial speed of the ball my initial gravitational potential energy will be m g times my initial height and my initial elastic potential energy here will be a half k times the square of my initial extension of the spring. Now there's actually something we can do here, we can look at this and say well what will I choose as my uh, zero point for my gravitational potential energy? Well I'm actually quite free to choose that zero point 
anywhere in the problem that I like. So I might, for example, choose that the particular height at the start of the problem is zero. I'm, I'm quite at liberty to do that. But you've got to be careful because can I say that the initial elastic potential energy is also zero? And it turns out that that's not possible. You might wonder why that's the case. Well, let's just look at how these forces give rise to their potential energies. If I was to look at how the gravitational force varies with height, for example, the gravitational force here is the weight of an object, and it's a constant near the surface of the Earth. And so remembering that my potential energy is equal to the negative of the work done by a force, I can see that if I chose this as my zero point and I went out to say this height here, then there's the work done by changing my height by that much. I could choose a different points here and as long as this is delta H and this is the same delta H, I get the same work done. So what my change in gravitational potential energy is doesn't matter where I choose my zero point. That's quite different if I look at how the force varies for a spring. The force for a spring, following Hooke's law, is proportional to the displacement from the spring's unstretched length. And so if here I chose this as my zero point and this was how much I'd stretched the spring, that's how much work would be done there. If that was my change in length. Of course, if I choose a different zero point and stretch it by the same amount, you can see I get a quite different value of the work done. And so the change in potential energy definitely depends here upon where I choose my zero point, and I must choose my zero point at the normal unstretched length of the spring. There's a big difference between choosing the zero point for gravitational potential energy and choosing the zero point for elastic potential energy. Now I can think about the values for the final state of my system. Now I will have my final kinetic energy will be a half mvf squared and of course vf here is the thing that I'm trying to find that's the quantity the question was asking me to calculate. My final gravitational potential energy will be mg times my final height and you can see if I'm taking my initial height as zero my final height uh, will be one meter above that and my final elastic potential energy will be a half k times the square of the final spring extension. And so now I need to make my initial mechanical energy equal my final mechanical energy and solve for the quantity that I'm looking for. So let's move my question up a little here. So now I want to have a half mvi squared plus mghi plus a half kxi squared is my initial mechanical energy. That will equal my final mechanical energy. All of those quantities with their final values involved. Now the only thing in this equation that I don't know the value of is vf, the final speed, the quantity that I'm trying to calculate. So I can now rearrange this equation to make that the subject of the expression. Here's my final. You might take two or three lines to do this if you want to be more clear, but I can see that to get vf by itself I'm going to need to divide through everything by m and multiply by 2 and then move some things from one side of the equation to the other. The final result I'll get here will be the square of the initial speed plus the spring constant divided by mass, multiplied by the initial spring extension squared minus the final spring extension squared, plus 2 times g multiplied by the initial height minus the final height. And I need to take the square root of that entire expression. Now a couple of things to note before we do the calculation with numbers is that this little expression here the difference between the squares of the initial and final spring extension will actually be a negative quantity. You can see there that initially the spring is less stretched than it is finally. And in the same way, this difference over here between the initial and final heights of the ball will also be a negative quantity. So let's move our page up for a second 
and put some numbers in here that we can calculate. We know that this will be the initial speed squared, so it was initially 12 meters per second. The spring constant we were told was 22 newtons per meter, and the mass of the ball was 1.25 kilograms. Being multiplied by the initial extension of the spring, now remember the natural length of the spring is 0 0.55, but the spring began uh, at a stretch of 1 meter, so that's actually going to be um, a distance from the natural length of 0 0.45 meters when we square that. And then this final extension when we're 2 meters above the ground is actually 1.45 meters away from the natural length of the spring. And then we need 2 times the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by 0, which is what we took as our initial height, minus 1 because we're 1 meter above our initial height. And we'll take the square root of all of that. And when I do that calculation, putting all of those numbers in, I get 9.5 meters per second. And that's the final result for the speed. Now we'd like to do some assessment just to give ourselves some understanding of this particular answer. The first one that's important is to realize that we expect the final speed to be less than the initial speed. The ball is being thrown upwards against gravity, so it will be slowing down. It also has a spring pulling down on it, so it will be slowing down even more. So it's good that our 9.5 meters per second is indeed slower than our 12 meter per second initial speed. A couple of other things to check in our answer here. Uh, again, this term here that has to do with the uh, change in elastic potential energy is negative. And in fact, if the spring was stretched further, that is, if this 1.45 here was even uh, a larger number, it's minus 1.45. So that being larger would make my final speed less. And that makes sense. As the spring gets stretched, it's slowing the ball down more and more. And in the same way, this term over here that has to do with the change in gravitational potential energy, if the ball went higher, this minus 1 would become a larger negative number, again making our final velocity smaller, as we would expect. The other thing to look at is that what would happen if our spring had a different spring constant? In this case it was 22 newtons per meter. If we had a stiffer spring, that would have a larger value for k, and again that would multiply through to make a larger negative quantity here. That larger negative quantity would again reduce our final speed. That makes sense. A stiffer spring would be slowing the ball down more as it went up, and so we'd expect at the same height the ball would be going more slowly. So that assessment gives us some confidence that this is the right answer. And just to recap, we were unable to use our equations of motion in this problem because the acceleration wasn't constant, but a relatively straightforward application of conservation of energy allowed us to calculate the final speed.